Some stories are just too difficult to describe in words. You have to listen to them yourself and make your own thoughts, feelings and opinions about them. And, well, I found three of those for you this evening. So you've got an anthology video for your Monday evening's delight. Three weird, wonderful stories that completely defy normal explanation. (laughs) I hope I haven't put you off by saying that, because they're all very, very interesting, and I think you're going to enjoy them. Well, my dear friends, once again, it's time for you to sit back and relax with your favourite drink, and listen. My pale hands soak in warm blood of unknown origin. I can feel a sharp pain, but upon inspecting the location, I found out there's no wound. Where is this blood from? I question the devil spawn in front of me. That's your blood. It responds with a grin, its shark teeth protruding from violet lips. What do you mean? The echo of my surprise travels around the abandoned church, bouncing off the walls and returning to my ears dozens of times before dying out. The shape before me blocks the silver light of the ever-floating night watcher, its horn standing as support for the giant. I'm overwhelmed by fear as its shade casts upon me and the sticky blood does nothing more than accentuate my dread. You've asked for immortality. It laughs maniacally. But what does this blood have to do with that? And what is this pain? I ask, holding tight onto the cloth that covers my chest. That is what is left of your heart. Do not worry, because you won't feel anything soon. You are no longer a human. Its tone switches pitches as it talks, a fruitless attempt at hiding its amusement. I notice a red spot is visible on the corner of its lips, and I dare guess that my organ became a snack for this beast. I try my best to hide my emotions, but nothing gets around this devil. The blood on my hands must be a little game of his, and this makes me furious. But it isn't like I asked for this. I wanted to be immortal. I want my body back. And I have granted you the one thing you wish for. The means of how I achieved that was for me to choose. You are now immortal. And you do not have a soul anymore. Your heart was the stamp for our contract. And there is no going back. Should your brain suffer an unfortunate accident, you will be no more than a stain of matter. A conscious one of that. If I'm not human anymore, then what am I? I speak tear-eyed, and I realize that I have no liquids left to cry. (sighs) A sack of walking flesh. You're rotting as we speak, but you'll never disintegrate. You horned bastard, this is not what I... It cuts me off with a stomp which made me lose my footing. Should your brain suffer an unfortunate accident? It pierces me with its bright red eyes. My fear rises. It feels it happening, and it growls, only to smile in satisfaction when I reach the threshold of breaking. But I am feeling generous, since you are so amusing. I can tell you how to maintain your living corpse in good shape. I feel disgusted being called a living corpse, but I bear with it because he mentioned there is hope. I'd better not anger it any more, I think to myself, and it nods as if approving. Before I can even ask what it is that I can do, It utters nonsense, madness, and a taboo I would internally regret breaking. You must consume the flesh of your kin. You must drink their tears so you can cry. And you must eat their eyes so you can see. 
It raises its voice. He couldn't wait to tell me what atrocity he cursed me with, and I can tell from his expectant, raised eyebrows that he is looking forward to my first taste rather than an answer. I contemplate what I got myself into as I stare at broken shards of a former mirror. The circle of salt did nothing because it stole my heart without me even realizing it. My pain is gone at this point, and out of curiosity, I place my hand over the fire of a white candle. It feels different. But I notice that his shade breaks logic, covering the reach of the orange flame and dancing across the wooden floor as a reminder of what I have summoned. Hands taste the worst. You have no idea where they might have been. Oh, but it's nothing for you to worry about. It jokes a joke that I don't comprehend. An alarm clock goes off from my wristwatch. And I remember that there's a time limit to this meeting. I prepared it beforehand just to alert me. But I'm cutting this meeting short to half an hour instead of one. Just to avoid any more misfortune. 10 p.m. displays the cheap plastic. I start blowing candles off, causing displeasure in the beast. It frowns as it slowly starts to fade, its dark skin merging with the black all around. <sighs> Enjoy your meal. Its deep voice disturbs my hearing. Moving a sticky palm across my body, I confirm that there are no heartbeats, nor is there a pulse on my neck or forearm. But I am feeling healthier than before. The illness must have been cured. I can't wait to prove the doctors were wrong by showing up alive in five days. I inhale without difficulty, but I realize I've been robbed of my sense of smell. The blood doesn't smell of iron, and the candles left no stench behind. I reach for the circle of salt, guided by the light of the moon, and take a pinch to place on my tongue. Then I pick more, and more, until I eventually take a mouthful of it. My body doesn't even react, let alone taste it. At first it was hard to notice, but the sounds of the night are progressively becoming quiet. The grasshoppers and flies are distracting themselves for some reason. A mosquito silently lands on my arm, but I barely have enough blood for myself, so this little bugger is not welcome. A powerful slap, with the intention of chasing it away, makes me realize what is happening. I'm losing my hearing at a fast pace. You must eat their eyes so you can see, echoed as a memory. I start panicking, unsure of what to do. Will I lose my sense of touch? What else is there to lose? Ah! Uh, I voice out in increasing pitch to test my hearing, but there was a limit of how much I could yell without attracting attention. I am completely deaf. I pick a quick pace and head towards a broken window, aware of my surroundings. Although the church was abandoned, the cemetery outside is still kept in tidy condition by three gravekeepers who work in shifts of eight hours. My eyes are getting hazy, and my lungs have difficulty in receiving air. The pacing slows down, my sight creating a cloud of non-transparent nothing before me. Patches of my vision are slowly eaten away by darkness, and I don't even know left from right anymore. I don't know where I am, or where to go. There is no clear image in front of me. I get on my knees, feeling out the ground around me. The dirt and grass I would other times consider repulsive to touch are my greatest comfort at the moment. I scream in fear and confusion, even though I hear nothing. I continue vibrating my vocal cords without stop, because soon... I would not even be able to. I can tell my lungs won't last much longer. I suddenly feel something on my shoulder. 
The cold sensation of the ground is fading, and I hopelessly reach with my hands to my back, touching someone's arm. But I can't feel it anymore. I panic, thinking that I've lost all my senses, and scream again, only for it to grab my forearm and lift me off the ground. I feel my way on his arm, with a fading touch, hoping he realises that I am blind, deaf, and soon completely cut off from the world. They do not retreat this time. The hands of the person are very hairy, so it must be a man. I eventually reach his face, and he rests his palms on the back of my hands as I hold his cheeks. He's trying to pull them off, but I won't let him. I push my thumbs into his eyes and follow up with my index fingers and middle fingers. My cheek is pushed very hard by something, jolting my head to a side as I reach the ground. I'm holding something squishy. I open both my hands and throw the contents into my mouth, lacking the feeling of my lungs. I don't even know if I'm breathing at this point. My vision clears up, and before me stands a man with red running down his cheeks. Two hands cover his eyes, the mouth hanging open and letting loose saliva. A badge on his uniform confirms that he is the gravekeeper. I stand up and rush towards him as he tries to walk backwards, crossing his hands in front of his face. He can hear my steps, and he panics. His retreat reveals a rock, and I cannot believe what it makes me consider, but I must. There is no other way I can think of. If I didn't do this, there would be nothing. I have to, I tell myself, reaching for the stone. It's really weird because I can see it in my mind, but I can't feel its weight, shape and temperature. I can't even feel a response from the strike to his head, my sight being the only proof I have that it happened. He is laying motionless on the ground, his former covered face bringing to light two empty sockets. I turn his head to a side and bite off his ear, and upon chewing on the second, I hear a crunch. I hear the insects all around me, and I hear the wind. I bite his nose off and swallow it. But as I do so, I feel like puking. The stench of urine hits me hard, telling me of an event that went under my radar. My teeth cut through his fingers with no difficulty, as if they were carrots, and a pulsating pain from my cheek startles me. This fucker had punched me. I pick the rock and crash it onto his chest, plagued by wonder and anger. The fear of almost being cut off from all my senses overwhelms my reasoning and primal instinct to survive. What about his heart? The sounds from the rock crashing on his ribcage are muffled by unconscious exhales upon impact. He's gargling with his own blood as my hand bathes in a pool of it inside his body. There is no reaction as I am pulling the heart out, but in no time he lies soundless. There is no taste, no matter what I eat. The heart is no different, but I can feel it is very chewy and easy to swallow. I did not expect in my wildest dreams that the man would wake up. I reach my lips to wipe my mouth, because... Although there is no taste, it feels disgusting. The blood is unnoticeable on my hand's dark skin, blacker than night. I have been waiting for you my entire life. Hello, kind reader. Let me introduce myself. My name is Alexandra Knight. I was an average 21-year-old young woman. I was average-looking, never got the boys, and went alone to the prom. I lived a fairly normal life. I went to college, studying to be a teacher. 
I wanted to make a difference and not just be a nobody. I wanted to help people. I love music, anime, and I adored sleep and my family, who loves me with all their heart. But my life changed on August the 4th, 2017. I had to walk to university this day, as I'd woken up late and missed my ride, my father taking me. It was incredibly rainy, wet, and looked very dark and grey. I had an umbrella and made sure I walked slowly, but me being the klutz I am, and the rain being so heavy, I could barely see a thing. I tripped and fell over my shoe. I fell into the busy highway. I tried to get up as fast as I could, but unfortunately, a driver speeding too fast hit me. I was rushed to the ER immediately. I suffered numerous broken bones, and I was in a coma. My fate was very dim. I suffered so much. My body ached like someone had stabbed me, and even though I was in a coma, I could somewhat sense that something was wrong, and faintly hear voices. I could feel my mother touching my hands and cheek. I could hear both of my parents' agony and cries, and begging to some god to help me get out of this. I even heard the doctor say, She's a goner. I'm sorry. After about a week, my parents realized it was probably the best for them to pull the life support off. I was finally out of my misery. But my mother wanted to say goodbye. Even though she'd been by my side for the entire time, she could not let go. Her goodbye choice was a lullaby she'd sung me ever since I was five years old. You are my forever. May the sun shine in your pretty little mind. My beautiful little flower, may you find protection always. Short and simple, but effective. It had helped me sleep many times, and I often dreamed of this protection. It was always a beautiful figure looking to be a male. I'd never seen his face, but I think I would recognize him, even in a crowded room, with the way he made me feel. The afterlife is not what you'd expect. I ended up in pure darkness, not the pearly gates that people talk about. I was in a dark room, wearing a beautiful fairy tale like gold dress, my brunette hair in ribbons and my feet barefoot. The dark ground felt so cold. I longed to be warm. Where the hell was God? I thought to myself. Isn't he supposed to come and take me to heaven? Walk this way. I had a deep, masculine voice call out in the pit of dark space that I was in. I indeed walked three steps. There was a man standing. He had golden hair and striking blue eyes. He was wearing a t-shirt that almost fit him like an odd-shaped dress. I thought he must be God, coming to get me. Hello, Alexandra. I am Oliver, the messenger of the afterlife. He spoke in a soft whisper. Um, hello? I responded awkwardly. You, my dear, have had a very simple life. I've done no wrong, but, well, I'm afraid God does not want you, my child. I gasped and wanted to respond, but before I could even mutter a word, Oliver pushed me out of the dark space, and down a tunnel-like object I went almost like a child swinging freely on a swing. I felt so scared and didn't know what to do. I was flying in this tunnel, and finally I landed into a warm red room. I thought this must be hell, since God doesn't want me like Oliver said. The space was red. A small fire was burning, but not intensely, as described in the Bible closed my eyes as I felt so warm and at peace here. Well, hell is such a strange place, I thought. I actually felt at home. Welcome to my kingdom, Alexandra, a soft, gentle, masculine voice said, leading goosebumps up my arms. I opened my eyes and now I was in a bedroom 
with red walls and a fluffy red bed, and a fireplace burning with a small cosy fire, and candy in a dish. It was so beautiful. Hello, I said to the man, as I was now looking at him, and he was so beautiful. He had long hair to the ground, black and white wings, red glowing eyes, and wore a dark suit. His body was slim and long. He was the most gorgeous man I'd ever met. I am Lucifer, and no, you are not in hell. You see, my dear, the Bible is wrong. Hell is actually where the good go, and God is the real devil. He is the one who burns. He didn't want you because you were pure and good, he said firmly but kindly. Then why does the Bible say he's a good man? I asked. Because it is a test to see who actually will receive the truth. So many have believed wrongly and end up in <laughs> heaven, he said with a sigh and an eye roll. I was shaken up and shocked. Then where are all the other good people at? And why am I in your bedroom? I asked. Oh. The others are enjoying my lava paradise. You're in my bedroom, Alexandra, because I chose you. And you chose me long ago. I've been waiting for you my entire life. It seems crazy, but I'm your guardian angel, and we have been in love since before time was even made. He looked at me and took my hand, bringing me into a hug. I felt my face flush, and grabbed his hand too. He hummed the lullaby my mother had sung to me, and he put his arms around me, my face buried into his warm chest, and we slow danced. Time stood still in the afterlife. Our time is much slower. I felt that coziness and the peace I'd felt in my dreams. This was my protector. The figure in my dreams was the devil. He looked at me in my eyes, and I looked back, and, and I love you was exchanged. I'm always protecting you, Alexandra, and the reason why men won't look at you on stupid earth is because I exchanged a deal with God, and that is he would never take and hurt you, and I would always protect you. No one would ever take you away from me, not even a human, because you are mine, and I cannot bear to let someone hurt you. You are precious. It's almost like a love spell. I didn't know what to say. A part of me was angry, and thought he was a bit selfish. But I understood it. He didn't want anyone possibly hurting me, even in the simplest way. I know you think I'm selfish, but I am not, and one day you will wake up and see that. Goodbye, Alexandra. I suddenly felt the room shake, and I heard my mother's voice. Alexandra, wake up! I heard her shout. You can't be late. I woke up. I couldn't believe it. I was dreaming. I didn't did that. As I told my mother I'd be leaving, I found a note in my room before I headed out the door. It read, Alexandra, I've given you another chance to live. Please be careful. I know I seem selfish, but I don't want to be, so I'm giving you this other chance to live, even if it means waiting 20 years or 50 years to see you again. I will always wait until we can be together forever. Enjoy this earth for as long as you can, and just know that I am always protecting you. Well, I guess it wasn't totally a dream, and I guess the devil isn't that bad of a man. No matter how hard I try, I always end up failing. It doesn't matter what it is that I'm participating in. Contests, relationships, friendships, sports, music, 
all my passions and dreams have been a long and disappointing slide. Angled at such a slight decrease that the descent from my peak, my aspiration, my dreams, is and always will be fruitless. Angled so that whatever venture I pursue bleeds its critical mass out of me until I hit the slimy pit of mud that awaits me at the bottom. It was like a cycle, you see. After laying in the mud for a moment, not too long, before it envelops every pore and drowns out the light. I rise with what strength I have and squint hopefully upwards. Through the piercing daggers of cold rain and torrent, I see a fraction of light reflecting off the top of another sleek slide. I tell myself, this is it, your true calling, the slide that never ends, knowing full well that I will end up in the mud again and again, until one day I won't have the strength to rise. I am, or was, a straight-A student. Throughout middle school, up until my senior year, I held a respectable 4.0 GPA. Nothing to hit the roof over, though. I was only ranked 100 in a graduating class of 615. I'm not innately smart or anything. I just work hard. Anyway, like I said, I was a straight-A student, implying that I am no longer never actually received a diploma, even though graduation was last Tuesday. People acted so happy that their high school lives had been successfully completed and packed away in the achievements compartments in their brain, readily available to gloat to anyone, like a vegan at a grocery store. I knew they weren't really happy, though. I knew deep inside they had the fear of failing like I used to. I have a knack for knowing these things about people. People are afraid of failure, and they should be. It would be better if everyone was so afraid of failing that they remain petrified by fear and stagnant in their lives. It would make it easier for people like me. You see, I've been exposed to failure for quite some time. And I'll tell you that the mud that's rising past my ears at this point really isn't all that bad. It makes me harder to see. Slippery and quite elusive. Of course, I don't mean that in an Arnold Schwarzenegger in Predator type of way. I mean that accepting my failures, often as they are, has made me a stronger being. A lot of people skirt through their short and poignant lives trying not to fail, to remain on that slide and never touch the mud like everyone else in the world. They may think that they're better or more accomplished than those of us further down, but they're not. They've become weak in their adversary-less lives. I suppose, should they die in their weakness, then they got lucky. They made it through the fire untested, championing to others the ease of modern-day life. <gasps> Get over it, right? Lucky for them, unlucky for others. How could I, you may wonder, be a perfectly content resident of that ever-suffocating mud pit? It's not hard, you see found the key down here, muddled nearly beyond reach, almost reproachable. You shouldn't fear failure, you should seek it. Why put the effort in climbing that ladder to the slide just to quickly slip right back to where you'd started? No, enough times of that will make a man go mad. Cuckoo, <laughs> take it from me. Failure brought me to this place, I could never be happier. I meet those stuck in the mud. I wait for all their strength to fade, for them to shrivel into a husk of their former selves, as I was. Then I take them and push them under. Some come back, others don't. The ones that fail to even keep their heads up are useful. The others that try to rise and aren't quite ready for me yet. They're like the few green apples passed by in the summer harvest. Those... I let go. People should be afraid now. Now that there's people like me. People waiting with unhinged jaws and gnashing teeth. Mouths wide open waiting at the bottom of that slide for an easy snack. Tread lightly and do not lose your strength. Have a healthy respect for failure and let it strengthen you. Or don't. It's all a matter of perspective really. A choice. 
I guess you'll know if you made the right choice by where you end up. Well, like I said, there was something very weird and wonderful about all three of those. Um, couldn't quite put my finger on what it was, but thematically they seemed to just work together quite well. Hope you agree. Did you enjoy them? Do you like me just to do single stories that stand alone and work on their own? You probably do. But anyway, I get a lot of the shorter stuff on in Dr. Creepin's Law, and I do like to give them some attention from time to time. So please just indulge me. <laughs> well, we're back again with Black Week on Wednesday. Hope you're enjoying that series. We're coming closer and closer to the end all the time now, moving on to the fifth out of the six installments. So, hopefully you'll see you again then. If not, well, I'll see you on Friday, won't I? But for now, sweet dreams and bye-bye. Thank you so much for choosing to spend your time listening to me. Now, if you enjoyed the Dr. Creepin experience, then come find me on Facebook. Come chat with me on Twitter. Listen to the background music and download it if you like on SoundCloud. Drop by the store, pick up a t-shirt. And, importantly, if you've got a story you'd like me to read, send it to Dr. Creepin's Vault, the subreddit I set up so that I could read your stories. Now, Looking forward to seeing you all again real soon, so come check me out, okay? <laughs>